Hello, I'm Andrew Pearce and this is The Daily Show from the Daily Mail Newsroom. Coming up, what will Brexit mean for your money? What's going to change and what isn't going to change? Money Mail have got all the answers to that. Well, you would have thought Brexit would have been great for Sarah Vine, our star columnist, but in her column today, she's revealed why she's gone off the whole idea and it's intensely personal. At Oxford, more spaces for working-class kids, but is it at the expense of privately of, of middle-class children? Is it a bit of social engineering? Wales has caught up with Scotland. They're banning smacking. They're making it against the law. I'm asking, how on earth can they enforce that? And smart motorways, which aren't so smart, great controversy now about whether they should be scrapped. Well, John Apter, chairman of the Police Federation, is the latest person to wade into the controversy about smart motorways. He says their death traps and their £6 billion rollout should be halted immediately. He said the roads were dangerous, uh, uh, putting both drivers and police at risk. However, Highways England insists smart motorways, where the hard shoulder is used as a regular lane, are safe because they have refuges for broken down vehicles. Well, joining me now is Claire Mercer from Smart Motorways Kill, who lost her husband, Jason, on the M1 last year. Uh, Claire, thanks for joining me. If I could ask you, if you can bear it, to tell us what exactly happened to Jason. Hi, yeah, um, yes. He, he'd got on the motorway in Rotherham, heading towards um, Sheffield and beyond, and he had a small bump with another motorist, um, and the, because there was no refuge in sight, and they'd just passed a sign that said no hard shoulder for four miles, they they didn't know what to do, I can only assume. They didn't know where they should pull over, because it's your legal obligation to do so. Um, they pulled over as far as they could in what should have been the hard shoulder, but the, the barrier stopped them from pulling out completely out of the lane. And because the the technology, this SVD um, technology, stationary vehicle detection technology, wasn't built into this motorway, nothing picked them up. The, t- the radar didn't pick them up. The camera, t- camera operators didn't spot them. Um, so the lane was never closed. Well, it wasn't closed until after they were killed. But they they swapped details, took photos, and unfortunately, a lorry didn't see them and hit them and killed them instantly. It's a terrible story, Claire. Um, you're in no doubt whatsoever. Your husband would still be with us, uh, still be with you and your mm-hmm. your children, if there'd been a proper hard shoulder where he could have done mm-hmm. the the right thing with the other with the other driver. Yeah, mm-hmm, definitely. Did- if there'd been a hard shoulder, this wouldn't have happened. Did you see the Panorama programme this week on smart motorways? I was in it, yes. You, of course, of course you were. <laughs> yeah. 38 mm. people, they say, have been killed on smart motorways in just mm. five years, and yet we still mm. hear that um, various parts of the government are saying they are still safe. What do you say to that? It's, it's absolute rubbish. It's absolute rubbish, and I hope they don't find out the way that I found out that they're not... I mean, they're saying that they're going to do this, these actions, these pinpoints that they've got out, but even them, and they're just sticking plasters. They, they, I've been told um, they're going to put more signs out, they're going to use more orange paint, and they, they're going to install SVD, which is an important step. It's still just an interim measure, but they're allowing three years. I mean, it's three years. We've had 38 people die in five years that we know of. You know, three years, I worked it out, that's about another 23 people that are expendable, apparently. Well, Claire Mercer, thanks for joining me. That's Claire Mercer from Smart Motorways Kill, who lost her husband Jason on the M1 last year. I always thought when they were called that, it was an idiotic name. And, of course, the government minister introduced them, now saying he was misled about it. That's Sir Mike Penning. Uh, Now, remember to tell your smart speaker to play Daily Mail News and you'll get the latest newsroom live from Mail Plus. And at five, hear the latest Daily Show. Wales has now joined Scotland uh, in passing a law banning the smacking of children. The Welsh Assembly voted by 38 to 14 on Tuesday in favour of this bill. It sees the country join 58 other nations, including Scotland, to end the physical punishment of children. Smacking a child in England is illegal, except where it count, amounts, counts to, amounts to reasonable chastisement. Joining me now is Sally Holland, Children's Commissioner for Wales. Sally Holland, um, is it the job of uh, politicians to tell parents how they discipline their children? 
Well, uh, governments and politicians shouldn't be telling people exactly how to live their lives or how to parent, but they do have a duty to give children and all their citizens basic protections in the law, and that's exactly what they're doing here, fulfilling their duties, in fact, under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child to keep children safe. But you are telling parents what they can and can't do. Well, in, in this one respect... Well, it's um, an important respect, with hard, respect. It's a very... It, it is an important respect, and that's why it's important that we are absolutely clear on what it means and that the law is clear as well. At the moment, it is a, it is a very grey area for parents and for um, in any professionals who are working with them. At the moment, um, it, it's the same law for adults and children. You shouldn't uh, assault um, someone else, and smacking does come under our common assault law. But at the moment, there's a defence. Um, in the court, if it got to the court, to say that it's reasonable punishment. Now, who decides what's reasonable and what isn't? How well, you hard have. Is smack and well, how you is. have. So, well, so, but you have, Sally Hot, you have decided. You and your, these politicians have decided what's reasonable, and the parents don't know better. I don't know any better, apparently. What it's doing is giving children the same, um, the same. Uh, protection in the law as adults have and I think we should expect at least that for our children if not more. I think it's important to clarify what it does. It gives um, children the same protection as adults. It doesn't create a new criminal offence. It simply takes away a defence if it got to the court. Yeah. And we have to remember there's a very high threshold of things coming to court. It has to be in the public interest and the child's best interest for a prosecution. What it does is it sets a clear message to children and parents that children deserve these protections. 58 other countries have done it and we've been out of step. We're, this is not a radical step. In fact, we've, we've lagged behind in the United Kingdom on this. But a parent who smacks its ch her child, a, a mother or a father who smacks her child on the legs, uh, if they're taken to court, potentially you're going to criminalise them. Well, as I said, um, there's a very high threshold for things going to court, but children in the end should have the same protection as adults. If um, a husband um, smacked his wife on the leg or vice versa, then again, that's potentially um, something that could be prosecuted. Why should children, who usually have more protection in the, laws than, in the law than adults, have less protection in this respect? Um, really, everyone in here is talking about parents' rights, but we really need to concentrate on children's experiences, and we're lagging way behind here. Wait. I'm old enough in fact, to remember the change in the law in schools and the panic there was over that and how controversial it seemed at the time that we wouldn't allow corporal punishment in schools. If we attempted to reintroduce that in schools now, there would be an absolute outlaw, out outrage. In 30 years' time, I can guarantee you mm. people will be amazed that we actually had this in the law. Were you ever smacked as a child? Uh, yeah, once or twice, not very often. Did it do you I any profound... Did it do any, do any it, profound it, lasting damage? It, it was the norm in the 60s and 70s when I grew up. Well, I don't know whether it particularly did me any damage, though I do remember finding it very unfair being smacked by my father, but without being asked why I was crying or moaning, as he said. Um, but what the research says, and I'm, I'm a professor of social science by background, the research is very clear here, is that on a population level, smacking does more harm than good and that other forms of parenting is better. And we have that clear uh, public health evidence just like with smoking, we all know someone in their 80s or 90s who um, has smoked all their life and is fit as a fiddle, but we know that at a population level it's not good for us. So, so, you know, we've got to go with the evidence, but we've also got to go with giving children the protection of the law that they deserve. This is a really, to me, a really uncontroversial move that we will all get used to very quickly. And, of course, we're keeping up with culture and society. Smacking is, is becoming rarer. And the majority of parents of young children in Wales um, support this law change. And in fact, only a small number of them now actually do smack their children. All this right. will accelerate that okay, change and make it clear for everyone. All right, that's Sally Holland. She's Children's Commissioner for Wales. I wonder if you agree with her. If you want to get in touch, you email me at dailyshow at mailplus.co.uk or follow us at mailplus underscore. Now, universities have agreed to meet a five-year target to increase the number of disadvantaged pupils taking up degree places, but the move by the Office for Students has prompted fears among some schools of class discrimination against pupils from more affluent families. An analysis suggests there should be 6,500 more students from poorer backgrounds at top universities by 2025. 
Oxbridge and Cambridge, of course, our finest universities, some would say, however, have refused to expand their total undergraduate numbers, meaning fewer places for better off pupils. Joining me now is John Bangs, former head of education at the National Union of Teachers and visiting professor at the Institute of Education. John Bangs, are people protesting about this, protesting too much? Is it, should we not be looking forward to the fact there are more disadvantaged kids getting to university? Well, I think it's blindingly obvious, actually, that disadvantaged kids are discriminated against in terms of going to university. I think what happens when you go to a private school is you get an enormous amount of support when it comes to private tuition, smaller class sizes, and the general view that actually the, the enormous confidence boost that you get when not only your family but the school and everyone is behind you. And I think uh, kids from, from poorer backgrounds don't get that boost. Well, I, well, obviously, I'm not in favour of uh, discrimination in terms of uh, trying to dumb down standards for kids from comprehensive schools, but there's lots of evidence that are very, very talented kids from comprehensive schools uh, are uh, eliminated from the process simply through the interview format at Oxford and, uh, Oxford and Cambridge, Oxford and Cambridge. One of the other things I would say, however, is that I, I am sceptical about o Oxford and Cambridge being the only universities and being the gold star uh, uh, universities that everyone wants to go to. There are some enormously good universities in the UK, apart from the, in, in Scotland, for example, and also some of what used to be called the traditional red brick universities like Bangor and Reading and some of the others that have world-class faculties in them. And I, and, and I think this pyramidal hierarchy for universities goes against... Uh, um, in, in a sense, the, the sense that, you know, the opportunities are only available in, in, in uh, two institutions. But um, I, I, I think, to answer your question, I think, I think the private uh, schools uh, are perhaps protesting too much. But I also think we need to have a look at um, basically highlighting the fact that there are other places that private schools maybe should send their kids to as well as Oxford and Cambridge yeah, or but equal you, value. You know, though, John Bangs, if you send your child to a very expensive private school, you want them to go to Oxford or Cambridge or maybe St Andrews yeah, in Scotland. They don't want to go to, um, uh, I'm not going to name a university, but you know what I mean. They want to go to those because they think they're the best. You look at the cabinet, it's stuffed full of people who went to Oxbridge universities. Yes, I know, and I think that's a debilitating thing for the Cabinet, for example, actually. I think what, what's happened is that you've got many of our leaders who are actually excluded from the kind of hard work uh, that uh, bright young people have to carry out to get to university in the first place. And, and in a sense, it, it, it is a, a, um, a view of the world, uh, if you've been to Oxford and Cambridge, that you... you it's, it's circumscribed. It's not what real life is about, actually. I mean, I, I really do think uh, that uh, a rethink has to happen about the nature of the university system and a highlighting of the fact that very many universities have enormously uh, important and fine world-class uh, faculties. All right. That's John Bangs, who's former head of education at the National Union of Teachers and visiting professor at the Institute of Education. I can speak with great f f uh, emphasis on this subject, as I never went to any university. Now, earlier on Twitter, I asked, are white middle class students being forced out of Oxbridge? 47% of you said yes. The new quotas are unfairly discriminating against middle class children. 53% of you said no, the quotas are a good idea. Do email me, dailyshow at mailplus.co.uk or follow us at mailplus underscore. Now, coming up, have your relationship suffered because of Brexit? The Daily Mail Sarah Vine will be telling us about her own struggles with family and friends and what exactly will the impact of leaving the EU be on our pockets? We'll have all of that and more, but first, of course, what's on TV? Claudia Connor's going to tell us. Thanks, Andrew. I'm going to start with talking about Spy in the Wild on BBC One. The icefall creates a rolling wave up to 10 metres high. In the turmoil, mothers and pups are easily separated. They must find refuge away from the glacier. I think if cute furry things float your boat, then you'll be on your element tonight. The camouflage cameras are trained on Japanese macaques. They're little monkeys. They live in the snow-covered mountains of Japan and they hang out at the thermal springs. And they do this bizarre swimming ritual in the thermal bars. And it's, it's very interesting to look. They look like these little sort of hairy, synchronised swimmers. 
and well definitely not cute and cuddly is Farage the man who made Brexit on Channel 4 so Brexit is looming and no matter what you think of him the man is synonymous with Brexit a documentary crew followed Farage over a five month period and it was after his huge success in the European elections last year it looks at his massive influence in recent years and whether there's any place for him in future British politics finally Kirsty and Phil love it or list it on Channel 4 if your home no longer works for you should you stay? I love it. Absolutely love it. Or should you go? I think it's time to go. Let's just list it. We're always ready. If you need to make a huge life-changing decision, then who better to help you than a couple of TV personalities that you don't know from Adam? The premise of this series is that people who can't decide whether to stay in their house and renovate or sell up put their future in the hands of Kirsty and Phil. So this week it's a couple from Rushton in Northamptonshire. But just like in location, 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 the best bit for me is it always comes at the end in the final credits where it's revealed that the couple decided to completely ignore the advice that they were given. Thanks, as ever, Claudia. Now, time for our regular city update with Ruth Sunderland, business editor at the Daily Mail. Now, if I need a new iPhone, and I definitely need a new iPad, it's got a great crack in it, <laughs> um, do Apple really need the money? They really don't need that extra money. It's quite phenomenal, you know, what's going on at Apple. Um, their market value now is over £1 trillion God. sterling. Um, now, we have That's almost as had... much as our national debt. <laughs> almost, yeah, yes. Not quite. Um, not quite. Um, so we, we have seen trillion dollar companies. Mm. Obviously, this all goes up and down with the stock market, with company share prices, yeah. and also with the exchange rate. But um, I think we're right in saying that this is the first trillion pound um, on a mainstream stock market for a mainstream company. There's a bit of talk about Saudi Aramco, the giant yeah. uh, Saudi oil company, but they've only floated a very small part of that company and it's only on the Saudi exchange, so it's not quite the same thing. Um, but this is really phenomenal stuff. And, you know, I don't know about you, I am, I do love my Apple products, even though I look at them and I think, well, I am paying a premium here for design um, and you could perhaps get them more cheaply you know get it get a get a version that was cheaper yeah. but th there's something about them they is are... this apple um is that an apple it is an apple yes yeah. so, 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 all iphones are apple all iphones are apple so yes. they've, they've conquered the world so, they, they, really? so they've conquered the world and it isn't just the iphone so the iphone's done really well but also their accessories have done well sort of the you know the earbuds the apple mm. watches the what they call wearables um and the services so apple tv the tv streaming streaming um mm. That's all doing really well. This, pod, this podcast is on Apple. Well, there you are, you see. Well, you, you, you're contributing to it. So it really is absolutely phenomenal. And, and the good news, I suppose, for, is that a lot of UK investors will have shares in Apple, perhaps they don't even really realise, but through their pension fund, mm -hmm. and they will be getting some of the benefit from, from, from that. Good news from Ruth Sunderland. And good news coming here from Deputy Sports Editor Matt Gatwood, because... Um, uh, Rafa Nadal, I can't stand, is out of the Australian Open. He is. He's out of the Australian Open. So the old guard, we Why thought... Why does he twitch and pull at his oh, body the whole time? I know. He's so... I mean, he is a great player, but he yeah. is incredibly frustrating to watch. A, because he takes so long, so long between points, for which uh, he was given a violation today. The was chair it? umpire said, that's enough, you know, you get a, a time penalty. And he responded with, well, you just don't like good tennis, which seemed to miss the point somewhat. Yeah. Point being, no, there's a rule, 25-second yeah. shot clock, and you've taken more than 25 seconds, yeah. nothing to do with good tennis, bad tennis. And does he do? Does he hang around to put his opponents on edge? I don't think so. I think it's just this it's kind just of superstition that he's got about. He's got to pick his pants four I times, know, and he's got this. to bounce the ball ten times, and do both wristbands and wipe his brow. And oh, awful! I, I know. He's a great, he is a great player, and he's obviously you know so many grand slams, but he isn't great to watch if you can uh, you know you know yeah. you can almost make a cup of tea while he's um, <laughs> while he's lining up his serve. You could do so, an entire roast dinner. He could do it in the time rest of the So he's out, so we don't Good. need to worry about Knocked him. Knocked out the quarterfinals you know, by the time he Dominic wants to Thiem. Make, so. Thiem. Dominic Thiem, Thiem, yeah, Thiem. So, Thiem. which is brilliant. So one half of the draw that's left is Team V Zverev, the right. youngsters, and the other half, obviously, as you the know. The next generation. The next generation coming through, and the other half of the draw, obviously, is Federer v Djokovic tomorrow morning. Mm. So it's brilliant. So we're going to get a first-time finalist in the Aussie Open from the Zverev team half. Um, so it's really interesting. Zverev, very interestingly, who beat Vavrinka in his quarterfinal, promised before the tournament started. Bear in mind, he was 
was an awful form before the tournament started, promised to give all his prize money to the uh, Austra- Australian bushfire. Ah, uh, wow. So at the moment, that stands at 2.23 million. So um, he probably didn't realise it was going to be quite <laughs> so high. Uh, well, he might be sort of trying to, hey, you know, I know those fires have gone out on that. Maybe yeah, I could uh, exactly. claim a bit of that back. But anyway, very interesting. So it should be good fun. Yeah, and talking of fires, those disgraceful scenes at the home of the Manchester United. Is he the chairman, the deputy chairman? Who was the Chief guy? exec, the Ed Chief Woodward. Exec. I mean, right. yeah, appalling. And no matter what so he's is done. Is he part of the Glazer family? No, he no, just works he, for them. He works for the Glazers. Right. And he is the one who's responsible for the commercial deals. Mm. And the money keeps pouring in mm. yeah, on the field. Obviously, they're not doing so well so but you know no matter how poorly they're doing on on the field no one deserves that so uh yeah his gate was graffitied and there were flares fired into his garden thankfully he wasn't there with his wife and two young uh children two young kids yeah two young kids that is gross appalling yeah they they were actually in london but you know they didn't know. Obviously, these no. awful... Have they arrested anybody yet? No. They were... Obviously, there's a crime scene, and, and that's ongoing. But um, the Manchester United are saying today they're going to step up the security around Woodward as a result of what they've seen, which, you know, is just a shocking and appalling yeah. and shouldn't have to happen. Why do they call football the beautiful game, Matt? <laughs> has its beautiful moments. Yeah, I can't remember That's many. not one of them, No, obviously. that's not one. That's Deputy Sports Editor Matt Gatwood. Money Mail has today looked at how things change or may not change after we leave the European Union on Friday. Under EU law, holidaymakers are entitled to compensation if their EU flight arrives at its destination more than three hours late. What's going to happen when we leave the EU? Amelia Murray, who is with me here, she's the chief reporter of Money Mail. Amelia, what is going to change? Will the compensation arrangements change on flights? So what we're going to see for the next year is this transition period. So actually not a lot is going to happen um, until next year. The transition period ends on the 31st of December, which is when they're going to be apparently sort of, you know, wrangling out all the final details. Sure. Um, The issue here is there's kind of lots of consumer law that has originated from the EU. um, Too much in my view. (laughs) Well, okay. Um, And one of them is the flight compensation rule. So if your flight is three hours late, um, depending on the the distance to where you're travelling, if you're on an EU flight, you um, can claim compensation up to €600. That should all be fine. From the the flight operator? Yeah. Yeah. Um, So that's kind of all sort of official EU law. Um, What we've been promised is that from next year, they're going to enshrine that law into UK legislation. Right. So if you're departing from a, a UK airport, then you should still uh, be compensated under sort of like the same rules. OK. Um, there's also other kind of consumer stuff. So, yeah. um, But it's all going to happen, you know, from next year if anything happens at all. So if you want to take your car or drive in Europe, um, you may need an international driving permit, which you don't need at the mm. moment in, in some European countries in the EU. Um, and, you know, you may also need a green card to prove that you've got insurance. And how, how easy is it to get an international driving permit? Easy. You just right. go to the post office. Oh, so it's um, straightforward. Yeah. Over the it's, counter? Yeah. Right. So it's just it's just another measure, though, kind of yeah. something that people... You know, in some countries, for example, Nigeria and Singapore, you need an international driving permit already. Mm. Um, but it's just kind of things that people, I guess, may have taken for granted. Yeah, and some people might find that slightly irritating, I guess. Now, what about um, British expats? They're out there. There's, um, what, two million, is there? One and a half million British expats living dotted around the EU. Um, what happens to their pensions? Because currently, I think they get... They increase in line with whatever's higher, inflation or wage growth. Is that going to stay the same? So so this has been something that has been of, of great importance to the, uh, you know, people wanting to retire to yeah. Europe, um, yeah. you know, to Spain, sunny Spain, to France. Um, Drinking their sangria at lunchtime. Oh. Bring it on. That's the life. <laughs> yeah. Um, and basically, expats in Europe have been uh, entitled to the same uh, triple lock right. as they would be to the state pension, which is, as you say, it's either 2.5% yeah. um, inflation or wage growth every year, this annual increase. Yeah. Um, what we do know is that if you retire uh, by the end of the year to Europe, this will still carry on. However, the guarantee is not there if you retire afterwards. So if so so hypothetically, if I'd retire in January next year, after the transition period's over, I might not get that triple lock arrangement. Yeah, there's no guarantees. It would basically be like the same as if you move to kind of New Zealand yeah. or old Commonwealth countries. Um yeah. they're not guaranteed this increase. Your state pension is basically frozen the, the day you re- leave. Better to all stay here then, aren't we? <laughs> and why would we want to leave? Because we will be in our new utopian, <laughs> our post EU utopia immediately. Oh, wow. There we are. That's Amelia Murray. She's chief reporter of Money Mail. 
And finally, three and a half years since we voted. Hooray, we voted to leave the EU. Britain's departure finally set in stone. Today, British MEPs left the European Parliament for the last time, marking the end of a long era, because we joined, of course, 1973. But what effect has Brexit had on British families, friendships or even relationships? Sarah Vine has written about her personal struggles in the wake of the referendum and joins me now. Sarah. People might have thought that this column, just before we leave the EU, you'd be rejoicing, but actually you've revealed how, um, in some ways, traumatic it has been for you and your family. Yeah, it's just not been a great three years. I think the thing is that, um, I mean, we were all quite surprised when the Leave vote won, um, but we had no sense of how vitriolic the response from the losing side would be and how we would all have our characters defamed um, in an attempt to reverse the result. Um, and it's just, it was, you know, I don't think anyone could have had any sense of how far the losing side were prepared to go in order to achieve the result that they had expected and wanted and I think felt that they were entitled to. Um, and it just, it just, it's just, I mean, I think it's interesting. I wrote that piece today and then today I've just had so many emails from readers sort of echoing the situation with, um, you know, friends and families and colleagues and, yeah. and but all saying the same thing, which is that, uh, you know, the, 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 they just think the level of vitriol has been completely disproportionate um, to, you know, to, the, to, the, to, to what they voted for. And, and, and as you say, um, in your, you say in your column, Sarah, you've been accused of, well, we all have, all of us who voted leave, racist, yeah. short-sighted, xenophobic. We're all thick, and, of course, we certainly didn't know what we were voting for, did we? Yeah. No, we're very thick, very, very stupid people. Um, we're racist and all of these things. And, and it's very interesting because of course when you when you uh, when you listen to a lot of the vo more vocal remainers, people like Lord Adonis, uh, Hugh Grant, that man who used to present the word. What's his name? I can't remember. Yeah, I know who you Quite mean. Quite an irritating. Yes, man. yeah, Michael anyway, Heseltine. Um, no, no, no. He didn't used to present the word. No, I mean I was chucking him into that list of that <laughs> roll call, that roll call of Ramonas. <laughs> But, I mean, he was on... I mean, the one who used to present the word, his name I forget, was on the telly the other day yeah. saying them soulless things. And it's all very personal. It's all, you know, you all deserve to die horribly. You're all old and stupid. And, you know, you've taken my children's future. And at the end of the day, you know, it's, it was a question about whether or not to stay within an economic union. I mean, it, you know, it's not a kind of... Uh, it, it's it's not people have conflated the the EU the institution with Europe you know the, exactly. the, the sort of na group of nations and that's not really what it was all about and the, and the idea that remainers. I think the response was overwhelmingly emotional, but it was, I think, partly fed into this whole um, sort of culture of being offended that yeah. is so prevalent at the moment, where everyone's upset about something all over the time. And uh, you know, a lot of very vocal remains, Gina Miller, they were all very upset because, you know, they, they considered it a personal affront. Yeah, you know, if I could ask you just, dead. yeah, but, and just finally, Sarah, because we're, we're short of time, but your own personal Sorry. friendships have been affected here because you and your husband Michael Gove, who is was one of the prominent Brexiteers in the cabinet, your own friendship with David and Samantha Cameron, that friendship has completely disintegrated, and it doesn't appear like it's ever going to come back. Is that sad for you? No, I, I, well, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm not an angry person, and I don't bear any rancor, but I think that ship probably has sailed. Yeah. All right, that's Sarah Vine. If you haven't read that column, it's brilliant, it's very powerful, it's very poignant and it's very moving and um, I agree with every word of it. That's all we've got time for today. For the latest from the Daily Mail News, we come back every day for briefings at 7am at 12 noon and, of course, 5pm where you can listen to me all over again. That's all from me, Andrew Pearce, from The Daily Show. I'll be back tomorrow. Have yourselves a great evening and good night. <laughs> <laughs>